Hello, once again, Kenny Jacobs from Bloomington, Illinois. I'm going to do another video today talking about current events as it relates to Bible prophecy. And, uh, well, I have uh, a lot of information today, a lot of news stories I want to cover. Um, so let me just do some quick scripture because I may not be able to tie as many, any, uh, as many scriptures into the news stories. So i got a lot to cover. Um, so let's just start with some quick signs of the times. Scripture from Jesus Christ himself. And then let's get into some news stories that will certainly tie in to all of that scripture. Uh, Matthew chapter 24 verses 3 through 14. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear war of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for the witness unto all the nations, and then shall the end come. Let's also go to Mark real quick. Mark 13. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> Mark 13, verses 28 and 29. It says, uh, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When, when her branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, Ye know the summer is near, so ye in like manner, when ye shall see all these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the doors. And then verse 34 through 37 says, Take heed, watch and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, that even or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Well, I've spent uh, a number of years studying Bible prophecy and watching. In fact, Bible prophecy is the reason I probably got saved. I was raised Catholic, but I didn't know anything about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Until I was about 16 years old, and then started looking into the Bible for myself, and looking at prophetic events, and... Uh, and I, I mean, now, 30 years later, uh, it's amazing how fast things are moving. And we are the generation that will see the return of Jesus Christ. So uh, I'm going to continue to watch and I'm going to continue to spread the word that we're living in the last days. And, um, you know, people always tell you, well, all this, there's always been wars, there's always been this, there's always been that. Um, but again, a couple of things. Israel was never a nation until 1948. That's a big deal. Two, uh, Jesus says here that uh, when you see all these things begin to come to pass, and we're living in the day now where all of the prophetic events are happening on an escalating, you know, just faster and faster, closer together like birth pangs, exactly like he said. So all the prophetic events are in place now. And all of them are increasing at the same time on a global scale. That combined with Israel being a nation for almost 67 years now. And the technology for the one world government is here. We are that generation. So with that, uh, let's get into some very important news stories. I have a lot to cover today. And so again, let's hope my technology works well. And uh, hope I don't ramble and get some of these stories, get too many things going on in some of these news stories. So I'll try to condense them as best I can. Uh, this first one is about the European Union. Uh, again, I talk daily about the rise of the new world order and the one world government. Now, again, I get the mockers and scoffers telling me that's just a conspiracy. It's a crazy conspiracy theory. There, That's not true. Yet, 
I keep pointing out how the world leaders keep talking about the rise of the new world order. These aren't Bible prophecy people. These are world leaders. Here we go. Fred, Frederica, Frederica Mogherini at the, Munich, at the Munich Security Conference. Uh, on November 9th, 1989, she says, We all thought that a new world order was about to start. I was 16 at the time, and at that age you were full of hope and dreams. Uh, she, she talks about uh, the, the future of Europe, the future of the world was not going to be bright and peaceful. The fall of the Ber Berlin Wall was opening the doors to great expectations and great opportunities. T today, 25 years later, we hardly dare to refer to any form of world order, and rightly so. In the world we see emerging, it's hard to define the centers of power. We are multiple of different nature and overlapping in a rather chaotic web. 25 years after the end of the old bipolar system, the world is far from being an, a, unipopular, a, a unipolar one, nor is it truly multipolar. Maybe we are living in times of absence of poles, times of an endless transition to something we cannot yet define. Complexity, conflict, interdependence seem to be the only elements we can be sure of when we refer to our times. The big question for all of us is, how do we try to make a change? How can we manage complexity, prevent or handle conflict, and take the opportunities that interdependence offers to us? How do we shape after 25 years, a new world order. Again, this is Federica Mogherini from the European Union talking about a new world order. Let me try to say how I think the European Union can contribute to addressing the many challenges and the few opportunities we face and hopefully trying to make the opportunities more than the challenges. Uh, again, I'm trying to Go, go, go this pretty quickly. First, by focusing on our immediate and wider neighborhood, I am convinced that as Europeans, we can only expect to be a credible global player if we act as a responsible power at our doorstep. Uh, again, I'm going to post the link to all of these articles in the description box so you can read them yourself. Um, she goes in and talks about the European Union and, and dealing with Russia and crime and uh, in the Ukraine and. Uh, all sorts of other conflicts around the world. Um, let me go down here a little farther. Now she's talking about Ukraine. She's talking about uh, Syria and Iraq and Islam and Arab countries. The... Uh, Role of Here we go, let's start here. Now in a region that is more turbulent than ever, it is all more important to find ways to bring the Middle East back on track of peace process. This has impact not only on the parties themselves, but on the region and the wider world. Our deep political and economic partnership with Israel and our role as the foremost donor to the Palestinian Authority give us a key position in reinvigorating the peace talks. Again, the European Union talking about reinvigorating the peace talks between Israel and the Palestinians. We know that, as we know that, that we need to build a new international consensus to get this conflict to a solution, the EU, Ru U.S., Russia, U.N. are the important pillars of this effort. We all bring different and complementary strengths to the table. I have invited the quartet principals to meet today to discuss the situation in the region and to underline the importance of the parties resuming negotiations as soon as possible. Uh, the quartet should prepare for a, presumption, a resumption of the peace process, including a regular and direct outreach to Arab states. The Arab Peace Initiative, with its vision for a comprehensive settlement for the Arab-Israeli conflict, remains for us a key basis on which a new initiative could draw. Um, and there's conflicts all over the world. She's talking about Kosovo and, and Serbia and the Balkans. Uh, The, the, the rise of new powers, the growing number of fragile states, as well as the risks that come from climate change, resource scarcity, and insufficient attention to human and social development, all demonstrate the urgency of forging strong partnerships. We need to define a new level of, of ambition on how we engage with the most important players around the globe. Partnership is also the key to increase the, inf the effectiveness of our common security and defense policy. We need to draw on all the instruments that we finally have, 
As EU, we must also work systematically with the UN, NATO, regional organizations, starting with the African Union. In a rapidly changing rule, we need to have a clear vision of the way ahead. So the final element I would like to emphasize today is the need for us to think and act strategically. In these times of crisis, it is not easy to go beyond the immediacy of today. But taking the time to look ahead is not a luxury. It is an essential prerequisite to transition from the current global chaos to a new peaceful global order. Read that sentence again. It is, a, it is an essential prerequisite to transition from the current global chaos to a new peaceful global order. Um, that's the whole concept of, of the new world order. Order through chaos. The European Union, the revived Roman Empire, along with the United Nations, is going to form the basis of the one world government. The Club of Rome has the world divided into ten regions right now. Seven-headed beast with ten horns. The ten horns are ten kings. There's ten kingdoms already divided. They're talking about the current global chaos and changing it into a peaceful global order. And this is coming straight from the European Union. It is not a crazy conspiracy theory. It is, an, it is inevitable. It is what is coming. There is a new world order coming. Now, speaking of the, the European Union, again, um, oh man, I must not have uh, saved this article, but here's the headline. EU said to be planning a fresh round of sanctions against Israel. Now keep in mind that the European Union claims to be allies with Israel. Although all their members keep voting to recognize the Palestinian state and force Israel back into a peace agreement, they will not be good for Israel, but they claim to be Israel's ally. And they're looking at fresh sanctions against Israel if they do not resume the peace process. The article I just read by Federica Mogherini talked about how they're the, they are a huge sponsor and donor to the Palestinian Authority. Why aren't they sanctioning the Palestinian Authority for not returning to the peace talks? Why is the world always blaming Israel? for a lack of peace in the Middle East. That's just amazing to me. Um, here's something else very interesting. This is on a Newsmax.com, and, and I've said repeatedly that there will not be another president after Barack Hussein Obama. He's the last American president, and that I do not foresee elections happening in 2016. Now, this is just kind of... Uh, just bear with me on this. I want to I want to go over a few things. Out of Newsmax magazine, Ben Carson, Christian values landed me on extremist list. Um, this is serious stuff. He is a candidate for president of the United States in 2016, yet he's on an extremist list. If you are a conservative, if you believe in if you're a Christian, if you believe the Bible, if you believe in uh, that the, the New World Order is a bad concept, if you are against huge government, if you believe you have Second Amendment rights to, own, to uh, have a gun and protect yourself, there's so many reasons why you are on a, a watch list as a potential terrorist. And get this one, this was because of his views on same-sex marriage. Likely 2016 presidential candidate Dr. Ben Carson Monday fired back at the Southern Poverty Law Center, which has included him in its extremist files because of his long-stated opinions against same-sex marriage. 
It is important for us to once again advocate true tolerance, the retired neurosurgeon said in a statement. That means being respectful of those with whom we disagree and allowing people to live according to their values without harassment. By naming Carson to its list, uh, the SPLC includes him along with former Ku Klux Klan leader and Louisiana politician David Duke and numerous KKK members, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, and more. Um, the SPLC, using a series of Carson quotes to back up its assertions, claimed that after Carson came to conservatives' attention with a speech condemning the Affordable Care Act at the National Prayer Breakfast, he soon was appearing as the keynote speaker at a rash of right-wing and hate group gatherings, linking gays with pedophiles, comparing the U.S. to Nazi Germany, and endorsing biblical economic principles for 21st century America. Um, This, this group, the SPLC, out of Montgomery, Alabama, describes itself as a civil rights organization. It includes on its hate map what many on the right consider to be simple conservative groups, such as the Family Research Council. Um, the hate map targets those groups that follow beliefs or practices that attack or malign an entire class of people, typically for their immutable characteristics, and is compiled using hate group publications and websites, citizen and law enforcement reports, field resources, and news reports. Wow. Um, so here we have, a, again, a, a candidate for president being listed on, an, on a, an extreme list of hate speech groups because they are conservative and they go against the Barack Hussein Obama administration and his goals and his agenda and the liberal, the, the left agenda, he's on an extreme list. Now, that's interesting because here's another article. Here's another candidate, Chris Christie, investigating Chris Christie. Now, a few months ago, they tried to come up with some bridge, closing a bridge scandal, and tie it into Chris Christie. It turned out that he was not involved in that, but they're at it again. And this is actually false information, but it's already been posted, it's already been out there, so... This is out of the uh, Huffington Post, I believe. Uh, it says, why is the press so eager to report Chris Christie is under federal investigation? Could it be because a Republican governor might run for president? Whatever the reason, last week saw several outlets reporting incorrectly that the U.S. attorney in Newark had launched a criminal probe into Christie's role in a case involving a sheriff and two deputies. Um, let's scroll down here to the bottom. Um, just one teensy problem. The U.S. attorney in question, Paul Fishman, says there is no investigation. Any, character, any characterization that we are investigating the governor about this is just not true, his office said. But it doesn't mean Christie is being investigated. Good to get, get that cleared up. But in the meantime, the damage has been done. Here, for example, is the lead to the New York Magazine Post. How many investigations does it take before a popular governor is no longer treated like a viable presidential candidate? If you ever wonder why Republicans think they are not being treated fairly by the press, look no further. Now, so now they're smearing Chris Christie, and there's that headline, how many, uh, what's it say, how many um, investigations does it take before he's no longer a viable presidential candidate? Okay? Now, a few weeks ago I reported that Rand Paul spoke at a gun rights convention, which that would put him on the watch list if he believes in Second Amendment rights. Just because he's Rand Paul, he's on the watch list. Because the uh, government says if you have bumper stickers that, that say that support Ron Paul and things like that, if you're a libertarian, you're a potential domestic terrorist. If the the watch list says if you are uh, against the United Nations, you're a potential domestic terrorist. And and at that convention, in his speech, Ron, uh, Rand Paul said he would be happy to dissolve the United Nations. So there's three candidates now that we know for sure would be on the list of the, of the DHS Department of Homeland Security list of potential domestic terrorists. So I maintain that there won't be an election simply because by the time 2016 elections roll around Barack Obama will probably have the entire GOP list of candidates tossed into a FEMA camp because they go against his liberal agenda, his uh, agenda to bring 
Islam to the United States, his agenda to take down Israel, his agenda to take away all of our rights as American citizens to promote the one world government, the new world order. It's crazy what's going on. And what's even more amazing is how they keep looking for scandals on the GOP side. Well, we've got, the, I mean, how many scandals has there been between Obama and his administration? I mean, I can't even count them all, but obviously it was a scandal when, when Barack Hussein Obama re released a five uh, terrorists from Gitmo in a trade for Bo Bergdahl, a deserter with Muslim parents. Um, Obamacare, obviously, in the Obamacare website, and his, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. If you like your insurance, you can keep your insurance, knowing full well that you couldn't. His handling of Gitmo now and trying to close it down and keeps releasing prisoners. Bringing Muslim Brotherhood into the White House. Uh, <clears throat> uh, what else? So we got, uh, he's, he's caught, constantly caught in lies. His turning against Benjamin Netanyahu. The Benghazi situation. The IRS scandal. The NSA. You got Hillary Clinton and her involvement with Benghazi and her famous line, What difference does it make? Uh, she lied in a, in a speech talking about how that uh, they got off of a helicopter and were under fire and had to run for from fire, which turned out to be false, similar to the uh, NBC News man and his false stories he's been telling. You got Eric Holder in Fast and Furious, among other issues. You got Lois Lerner in the IRS scandals and the lost emails. You got Jonathan Gruber, who has close ties to the Obamacare and the Obama administration. And uh, then you got Obama on on a uh, open mic, leaning over to meet to Dmitry Medvedev, Medvedev uh, from Russia, saying, "Tell Vladimir Putin, I, I will have much more flexibility after the election." I still would love to know what that was all about. Uh, there is scandal after scandal after scandal in the Obama administration, but they're worried about people who are worried about having constitutional rights and, and not giving in to the New World Order agenda, not letting the government take your guns away. Um, that's, just, that's just absolutely incredible um, to me what's going on right now. And it, it, is time, it's, it is time to wake up because, again, Barack Obama promised to fundamentally change America. And that's exactly what he's done. And Henry Kissinger said back in 2009 that they want Barack Obama to bring in a New World Order. How many times have you heard him and Joe Biden talk about the New World Order? Uh, Frederica Rogarini just did in the European Union. Uh, last week I reported that Russia, India, and China are on board with saying we need a New World Order. Um, wow, are things moving fast. All right. Um, this one, I, I want to touch on this article real quick. Uh, this is out of Jerusalem Post. Netanyahu to Jordan's King Abdullah ruled it should unite against barbaric cruelty of ISIS. This is a story from a few from a week or so ago, but I want to go back over because I just want to again say keep your eye on King Abdullah. Right now he's kind of taking the lead with Jordan in this fight against ISIS because Barack Hussein Obama won't even use the word radical. Islamic terrorism and, and uh, seems to be doing as little as possible in this fight against ISIS. But now, King Hussein of Jordan is, is, is appearing to be a hero and a possible peacemaker within the Middle East. And keep in mind that Jordan manages the Temple Mount. And this article says, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu phoned Jordan's King Abdul on Thursday and extended his condolences to him and the Jordanian people uh, following the murder of the, Jordan, of the Jordanian pilot. Netanyahu said that all civilized people were shocked by this barbaric cruelty which the world must unite to fight. Um, <clears throat> keep in mind, that, uh, in fact it says here, Thursday's phone call marks the first time the two have spoken since they met in Amman in November together with U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry at the height of the tension surrounding the Temple Mount. Um, it's just very interesting right now that we got King Hussein from Jordan uh, 
taking the lead in this fight against ISIS. He controls the Temple Mount. He's been meeting about the Temple Mount with Israel, United States, and now he's kind of seen as a, you know, a moderate Muslim that wants to, you know, help stamp out radical Islamic terrorism in this fight, and appears to be a, a friend to Israel. Um, just keep an eye on that. That's that's a very interesting situation that's that's developing in the Middle East. All right. Uh, there's another interesting story. Pope Francis will have some U.S. legislators squirming in their seats. Fittingly, this is out of Al Jazeera America. Um. Pope Francis coming to speak to the Congress um, says Pontiff's speech likely to critique economic policies advocated by GOP-led Congress that have contributed to inequality. <laughs> nice, nice headline. Blaming the GOP for inequality. All right. It says when Pope Francis becomes the first pope to address a joint session of Congress in September. Many Catholic theologians and activists expect that he will focus on rising global economic inequality rather than on the hot-button cultural issues that often dominate U.S. politics, such as uh, women in the Catholic Church, birth control, reproductive rights, uh, LGBT rights, and abortion, things like that. Instead, they predict the Pope will use his critique of the current global economic order to challenge his audience on the role of government in, in, in alleviating inequality as well as on immigration and climate change. The speech that Frederica Mogherini just did, I, I, I highlighted some of. She's talking about the same issues of inequality and climate change. Pope Francis is all over this open borders and immigration thing and climate change. And again, he's worried about the current global economic order. I do have to go to some scripture real quick because this is very, very important. Revelation thirteen eleven, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And verse 16, And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. He wants to control the global economic order, and he's worried about alleviating inequality. How do you do it? You control who buys or sells. You control the resources. Let's move on. The central message of Francis's papacy has been that income and wealth inequality in our world is the source of social ills. Until we remedy that, we won't have any sort of real peace or good community. Francis's view on the global economy is deeply rooted in Catholic social justice teaching that demands care for society's most vulnerable to promote the common good. You're going to start hearing more and more and more about the common good as the one world religion, and one world government rise. Francis's critique of global capitalism uh, decries that the economy of exclusion, uh, he says we are in a state in which someone isn't useful, they, then they simply don't exist. He talks about the throwaway culture, uh, to describe how people like consumer goods are used to act and used and cast aside um, this is just very interesting how much Pope Francis is getting involved in global politics and the global economy. Um, the Pope is not going to offer detailed policy proposals, but I would expect him to be unambiguous about the moral dimension and the reality that so many are left behind in our global economy. That's interesting because the UN just had a meeting with the youth of the world, and they came up with five things, and the number one thing was no one gets left behind. And here we are again, Pope Francis talking about nobody getting left behind in the global economy. Um, I 
While Francis is, is in the U.S., he is expected to attend the U.N. Summit on Sustainable Development Goals, which will address eliminating poverty and promoting environmental sustainability. Um, guys, again, it is time to wake up. This, this, this thing, it says, in the end, Mr. Boehner may regret that he invited him. Uh, Francis is, is helping bring on the, the New World Order, One World Religion, One World Government at an alarming rate. And he's got the ear of the Amer of the world, and they and they all love him. They think he's great, uh, just like the whole world thought Barack Hussein Obama was great in two thousand and eight. Couldn't see the handwriting on the wall there. Uh, what could possibly be go wrong with a one world government, a one world religion? Wow. Well, I can tell you what can go wrong with it. <laughs> It'll lead right to the Battle of Armageddon, the beheading of people who do not accept the mark of the beast. And the return of Jesus Christ to this earth to set up a true one world peaceful religion under his reign. All right. Um, but the, again, Pope Francis is preaching the same gospel that the UN, the EU, and Barack Hussein Obama are preaching. All right. Here is another interesting news story I found today about the RFID technology and how it just keeps getting used more and more. And, Seems to be it's being promoted as a great form of uh, of payment and convenience. This says Aspen Snowmasses skiers use RFID lift tickets to pay for food and rentals. Visitors can now utilize their lift tickets to make purchases at restaurants, stores, and rental offices, while ski instructors can use the technology to track class sizes. Now, what's very interesting in here is they, they talk about how um, the skiing company uh, says that they, they, can, they, they considered how tickets could be used to enable hands-free payments. Um, he said, notes the, Blanchard notes that skiers typically carry cash or credit card in a pocket, which either of which can become lost on the slopes and can be time-consuming to locate and remove from a pocket at the point of sale. So it's going to be so convenient to have this RFID where you don't have to bring a credit card or cash. You don't have to go searching for it because it says here that um, each gate has four antennas um, that can read the tags from a distance of a foot or more. As such, skiers can ski right through the gate and have their lift tickets read and approved before they board the lift. Um, so now they can pay with their R... But here's the thing, guys. You could lose your ticket... Couldn't you? Just like you could lose your credit card, certainly you could lose your ticket as well. Right now, it's an RFID ticket to pay, and it's hands-free. It says this, it's this, let's see here. Um, but you know what? The next step is, hey, now we're getting too many lost tickets. You can't lose a chip embedded in your right hand or forehead. That's where it's headed. Uh, let's go. This is a pretty long article. Let's go to the next page. So they're talking about advantages of all this, and it says the second. Uh, I don't know, the second advantage has to do with uh, point of sale terminals and all that. I'm not going to get into all of that. Um, but it says if the skier visits the restaurant and makes a purchase, the RFID tag can typically be read through clothing, and so that if he stores his lift ticket in a pocket. On the arm of his coat, he need only position his arm near the reader, and the tag ID number will be captured. He can then follow the prompts to approve the transaction and have it charged to his credit card. Uh, once the restaurant system was working well at, a restaurant, at the restaurant's 18 food establishments, he says the company began considering the equipment rental areas and retail stores that it operates. So now you can rent your equipment and buy a coat or jacket or whatever in the stores and pay for your food with your ticket. But again, like I said... Tickets can be lost. Tickets can be stolen. But a DNA uh, enhanced RFID chip in your hand cannot be. That's the next step. I'm going to read it again. Revelation 13, 16. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in the right hand or in their foreheads. That no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And I'm just amazed. How many people tell me that is such a... You know that could that that could mean anything. That could be mean anything. Those prophecies are so vague. No, that's not vague. He causes you to receive a mark in your right hand. That's what's going to happen. That's what's already happening. People, you need to wake up. 
All right. Um, let's go back to this article. This again, the Middle East peace process. Middle East diplomatic quartet urges resumption of negotiations as soon as possible. I reported earlier the UN, excuse me, the EU is considering putting sanctions on Israel if they don't resume these talks. Um, this is out of the United Nations Center Online. It says the European Union, United Nations, United States, and Russia, representing the diplomatic quartet and the Middle East peace process, have urged the resumption of the Israeli-Palestinian negotiations as soon as possible. Uh, a sustainable peace requires the Palestinians' aspirations for statehood and sovereignty and those of Israelis for security to be fulfilled through negotiations based on a two-state solution. The quartet also expressed its deep concern over the difficult situation in Gaza where the, p the pace of reconstruction needs to be accelerated to address the basic needs of the Palestinian population and to ensure stability and stressed that donor funding is critical. The quartet also recalled the importance of the Arab Peace Initiative with its vision for a comprehensive settlement of the Arab-Israeli conflict and the vital role of Arab partners. And the group expressed their warm appreciation for the tireless work of outgoing UN Special Coordinator for Mideast Peace Process, Robert Siri, which brings me to that next point, that... Uh, the EU just appointed a new UN Special Coordinator for Mideast Peace Process, Nikolai, Nikolai Ladenov. And I, very interesting. This guy's got ties to Iraq, ties to the Palestinians, and he's the new Mideast Special Coordinator for Mideast, for the Mideast Peace Process. A lot of things going on with this. This peace process will not die. It will not go away. It is time to be confirmed because that's the day and the age that we're living in. Uh, the Antichrist will confirm the covenant with many for one week. Uh, and in the midst of the week, he will cause the sacrifice that will, will have resumed in the third temple in, in Israel that will be built. The Antichrist will enter that temple, declare himself to be God three and a half years into the final seven year period of time, and then all hell will break loose on earth as Satan actually enters the Antichrist himself. That's where we're headed. And I know that sounds crazy, but it's the it is the truth. It is in the Word of God. And again they're talking about Israel security and peace. And first Thessalonians chapter five, verse three says, For when they shall say peace and safety. Then sudden destruction come upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Um, all right, uh, let's go on. A couple more news stories I want to cover here real quick. Um, hundreds of churches to celebrate Evolution Sunday as others celebrate Creation Sunday. Well, we know that Pope Francis believes in evolution. He said a, little while, a few weeks ago that evolution and the Big Bang are true, that God does not have a magic wand, and he cannot do everything. But this is not a Christian news, so I wonder if uh, Pope Francis is going to be speaking and celebrating Evolution Sunday. Um, nearly 500 churches in the United States will commemorate Charles Darwin's birthday this week with Evolution Sunday. God help us. But many other congregations plan to recognize the biblical creator and celebrate Creation Sunday instead. Again, I truly would like to know which side is Pope Francis going to be on that day. I think I know. Uh, February 12th, Darwin's birthday is commemorated each year by atheists as International Darwin Day. Huh. Can we have an International John 3.16 Day? But the atheists would say, no way. Um, however, many churches also plan to elaborate, uh, to excuse me, to celebrate the birth of the notorious naturalist, uh, and celebrate Evolution Sunday or Evolu with Evolution Weekend events. Evolution Weekend is an opportunity for serious discussion and reflection on the relationship between religion and science. An ongoing goal has been to elevate the qu the quality of the discussion on this cr critical topic and show that religion and science are not adversaries. Uh, to counter the Evolution Sunday apostasy, praise God, many churches are planning to instead observe Creation Sunday as an affirmation of their beliefs in biblical creation. Tony Breeden, founder and organizer 
of Creation Sunday told Christian News Network that biblical creation beliefs are important because evolution undermines the authority of God's word and the foundational basis of the gospel. If I can't trust the plain meaning of the Bible in Genesis because of all the because of the all natural presuppositions of science, why should I trust it when it speaks of the virgin birth, water turning into wine, the resurrection of Christ, or any other supernatural claim in the Bible? It's a slippery slope and it undermines the foundational basis of the gospel itself. Um, very interesting. So, again, you can just see how the church is buying into the New World Order agenda the, the, uh, and the atheist agenda, scarily enough. Actually, <laughs> and buying into to, uh, evolution. First Timothy, chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times... Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Evolution is giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, and certainly speaking a lie. Um, that's it's, it's amazing how far the church has fallen. Again, another sign, Jesus is coming back really, really soon. Here's another similar article. Uh, let's see here. Uh, students opposed to the LGBT agenda shamed in the classroom. It's out of Fox News. Teenagers at a California high school were publicly shamed for disagreeing with speakers allowed to push an LGBT agenda during an English class. According to, uh, this is the Sheer Straight, the, excuse me, the Queer Straight Alliance at, Al at Alkaline's High School in Lafayette, lectured students in several ninth grade English classes about LGBT issues. According to Brad Dacus, president of the Pacific Justice Institute, which is representing the parents. Well, again, you know, a Christian couldn't go in there and lecture students about biblical principles. So why are they allowed to go in there and indoctrinate children for the LPG, LGBT issues? During the class, the students, aged 14 and 15, were instructed to stand in a circle. They were then grilled about their personal beliefs and their parents' beliefs on homosexuality. That is way... Out of line. Uh, the QSA had students step forward to demonstrate whether they believed that being gay was a choice and whether the parents would be accepting if they came out as gay. Students who did not step forward were ridiculed and humiliated. Uh, PGI, PGI, PJI is a law firm that specializes in religious liberty cases. They are representing several families who had children in the freshman classes, some of whom are also were angry because there was no parental notification of the LGBT lecture. Singling out students for ridicule based on their moral and political beliefs is a Marxist, Marxist tactic that should have no place in the United States of America. Praise God. That is so true. Um, so students were given a handout with LGBT terminology, including words like pansexual, demi-boy, and gray gender. Demi-boy demi slash girl is defined as someone who only partially identifies as a man or a woman, Gray gender defines someone who feels as though they are sort of they sort of as though they sort of fit inside the gender binary, but their gender is more hazy and undefined. Um, that's what's being taught in our schools. Um, but again, it's a big issue if you want to do pledge of allegiance and say one nation under God, and uh, if you carry a Bible to class, and it's just amazing because all these people are saying that they promote tolerance and acceptance. The problem is, they are only tolerant of people who share their views. That is not tolerance. That is totalitarianism. That's what Ben Carson was talking about earlier today in one of the other articles. It is. I can't stress how important it is... It is time to wake up. 
the rule is about to change in ways that you cannot believe, and nor do you want to even be a part of. Um, Revelation 13, 3, And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Um, and there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Again, that's three and a half years. That's that final three and a half year period I alluded to earlier. The Antichrist will confirm the covenant, which will start the new world order. And one world government will begin forming, and it will truly take over three and a half years into it. When Satan himself enters the Antichrist and he breaks the covenant. We are there. We are at that time. All the signs that Jesus Christ told us to look for are here. It is incredible what's going on. So the important thing is, are you saved? Do you know for sure if Jesus came back today or if you were to die today that you are saved, that you are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ? If not, today is the day of salvation. All who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And Jesus Christ himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you recognize that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you call out to him in faith, he will save you. I want to read a quick passage here. This is a great passage to me in the Bible, one of my favorite ones. Luke chapter 23, verse 39 says, And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me, in paradise. Here we have a, a thief being executed on a cross next to Jesus for his crimes. He recognized that Jesus Christ is the King, the Lord. He said, Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And he admitted, he said, I deserve this. I am dying justly for my deeds. He realized he was a sinner, deserving of death. And he asked Jesus, to remember him. And Jesus saved him. For all of you who believe in purgatory, that right there alone rules it out. Was this gentleman baptized? No. Was this gentleman, um, did he do any good works at that point? No. What did Jesus tell him? You will be with me today in paradise. He didn't say, after you are purified and you finish paying your debt for your sin, you will be with me. No, that's not what he said. He said, today you will be with me in paradise. And no matter what you've done in your life, no matter what sins you've committed, if you turn to Jesus right now in faith and ask him to forgive you, he will. And then if he comes, down, comes today, you will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall you ever be with the Lord. But he is the only hope of salvation. Turn to him now while you still can. We are running out of time. Keep looking up. God bless everyone.